Anglo-Saxon dialects were very influential for modern English. They provided a base for English to add other words from other places. Although only a few Anglo-Saxon words are still used today, they are some of the most essential and common words in modern English. The Anglo-Saxon languages served as the foundation for English. These languages were spoken by a group of Germanic people who invaded Britain in the 5th century CE. Some of the main groups of these people were the Angles, Saxons, Jutes, and Frisians. All of these people were living in northwestern Europe around this time and spoke similar and possibly mutually intelligible languages to each other. To understand how these invasions started, we have to step back a bit. To understand how this all happened, we first have to know a little bit about the Celts. The Celts were the nomadic people who inhabited Britain from somewhere in the range of 800 to 200 BCE to around the 5th century CE. At around 300 BCE, the Celts were the most widespread branch of the Indo-Europeans in the Iron Age Europe, and they had inhabited most of Western Europe. They continued to be the dominant group in what is now England until this time period that we are talking about in the first millennium CE. The Romans conquered Britain in the first century AD, and while they had political control over the region, and instilled many aspects of their culture, the Celts still maintained much of their culture and identity. When the Romans pulled out of Britain, they left the Celts vulnerable to attack from the Picts and Scots in the north. Around 430 AD, a Celtic warlord named Vortigern had the brilliant idea to invite Jutes to settle on the east coast of Britain to serve as a meat shield to protect the Celts from the Picts and Scots in the north. In return for this, the Jutes were allowed to settle in southern Kent, Hampshire, and the Isle of Wight. Around the same time, the Angles and Frisians began to settle the northeastern part of Britain. From the 470s on, Saxons made increasing numbers of incursions into southern Britain. These various Germanic tribesmen gradually displaced the Celts, and this whole ordeal was less of an invasion and more of a gradual encroachment. As a result of their displacement and marginalization, the Celts had very little impact on the English language. Once the Germanic tribesmen had control of Britain, they began to settle down and farm the rich British soil. Soon the Germanic tribes settled into seven smaller kingdoms known as the Heptarchy, the Saxons in Essex, Wessex, and Sussex, the Angles in East Anglia, Mercia, and Northumbria, and the Jutes in Kent. The warlike Saxons gradually became the dominant group and ruled over what is now England. Distinct dialects formed within two or three generations of the Anglo-Saxon settlement. Four large dialect areas are generally recognized because that is all the written evidence that still survive. The main dialects were West Saxon, Kentish, Mercian, Northumbrian, and Northumbrian. There were seven different kingdoms called the Heptarchy. Dialects didn't correspond to kingdoms at this point. In the early times of the settlements, writing was closely tied to Christianity. In fact, it was mainly only clergy who were literate. Manuscripts from this era were very specific, as the documents made and saved would be useful to the clergy. King Ethelbert of Kent also converted to Christianity as a result of Roman missionaries, which led to more people converting to Christianity. In turn, centers of European culture and learning developed. The upper class used Latin because they could afford an education. Old English was the language of the poor, illiterate class. Viking raids happened after King Ethelbert's reign. Some of the Vikings assimilated into the population, which changed the Old English language. King Alfred the Great came to power in Wessex in 871. He was very influential in the spread and use of Old English. He was the first to claim kingship of all of England. He was a unique military leader in that he befriended the attacking Scandinavians. He helped urbanize areas and make roads, some of which still exist to this day. Most importantly for Old English, he created a primary education system for all freeborn children. In order to have an education system, there had to be documents and things to study from and read. For this reason, more and more people wrote in Old English. It was the language in all the school books and new works. Older documents written in other di dialects like Mercian and Northumbrian were translated into West Saxon. The king encouraged its use. Many people, rich and poor, were educated in it. West Saxon was spoken in the center of political power, new documents were written in it, and the king supported it, therefore it became the standard dialect of Old English.
Anglo-Saxon was the foundation of the English language, even though a small portion of it still exists today. Those words, however, are some of the most commonly used words, like the and and. However, Anglo-Saxon has different vowels, as well as some sounds that differ, like the Latin letters uh, thorn, ash, and et, which could also come from the Latin exposure from before Christianity spread to the British Isles. Old English also didn't have a J, K, Q, or W sounds. It's not exactly clear why they don't have some of the sounds we do, but a W sound is a softened version of a V sound, which Old English had. Sounds have also changed from uh, modern English. Some examples being that the combination of consonants SK softens in modern English to an SH, such as in skip, boat, to ship. Old English also had abstract compound words that meant other things, but were used inconsistently throughout texts. One example is the poem Beowulf, which had around 500 words that were only seen once in the whole poem, and almost all of them were the first recorded use of the compound word. Here's an Old English sentence as an example. Notice how the particles and, on, to, and as well as is are derived from Anglo-Saxon. The is also from Anglo-Saxon, though it does not show up in the text. The English sentence as well has the same particle being used in the sentence translation. Some of the nouns are the same, or at least sound the same. King of Old English is where we got our king from, and futon is similar to fought, but that's a little bit of a stretch. Some of the Old English words we might think are similar are really not. We might think that wife means married woman, but in Old English, wif uh, translates directly to woman in general. Same thing with fast. The term hold fast uses the Old English meaning of fast, to stay in one place and not move. Our fast is different, meaning quickly, hastily, etc. Fun fact, many of our swear words are derived from Old English. Modern English is an analytic language. This means the order of the words in a sentence are used to indicate what's its meaning. For example, the dog ate the cat is different from the cat ate the dog. In grammatical terms, the order determines which is the direct object in the sentence, what is being eaten, and which is the subject in the sentence, what is doing the eating. Old English is not like this at all. Old English is an inflicted language. This means the endings of the words affect the meaning, not the order. For example, dog plus subject ending a cat plus object ending is the exact same thing as cat plus object ending, a dog plus subject ending, or a cat plus object ending, dog subject ending, or a cat plus object ending, dog subject ending, eight. However, if you switch the endings, dog plus object ending, cat plus subject ending, eight is a different. In Old English, there are three different types of words, masculine, feminine, and neuter which each conjugate differently in different firm forms. The subject endings for nouns, pronouns, and adjectives are divided into five categories, nominative, genitive, accusative, and dative instrumental. Nominative is the naming case and is used for subjects. For example, Alfred is my name, where Alfred takes the accusative ending. The brothers divided the kingdom, and the great king ruled the kin kingdom. For genitive, his king was famous, where his takes the ending, the king of him was famous, and the swords of that large kingdom were sharp. The words that modify the noun are also taking the ending in Old English. For accusative, harmonious praise dantia, where dantia is the uh, accusative, uh, Alexa rewarded the warriors, and harmonious rewarded those brave warriors and the Viking ships came into the harbor. The dative in case is the indirect object case, and it is used to show the indirect receivers of the ap action. So, Dantia praised Alexa to Harmonious. Harmonious is the one being praised to, so he takes the case, and Dantia praised Alexa to the warriors, and Dantia praised Alexa to those brave warriors, and, as in the other cases, the modifiers also take the ending. The objects of most prepositions also take the dative case. For example, Dantia struggled with illness, Harmonious hid in the city, Dantia prayed for victory, and Dantia struggled with that horrible English. An instrumental noun is one that is being used to accomplish something, and it takes the instrumental ending. For example, 
Dantra killed Harmonious with a sword. And Dantra killed a Viking with a sword plus state of ending. Anglo-Saxon, or Old English, was the foundation for the changes that would occur in Middle and Modern English. All of the important particles are still intact, and the people that settled in Britain became the English. The language may have changed after around 1500 years, but it will be a lasting element in all other changes to come.